Despite some slips along the way, we're looking at you, Euro Disney. <laughs> Disneyland and Disney World have been some of the most successful theme parks in existence. Oh, oh my God! Chloe, we're going to Disneyland! So it may come as a surprise to people to know that there are tons of ideas for attractions and rides that were abolished over the decades. Now shut up and eat your garbage. So let's look at the top 10 attractions that almost became a part of Disney's theme parks. <laughs> the Great Muppet Movie Ride. With Disney owning the rights to Star Wars, Marvel Comics and Pixar Films, it's hard to recall that one of their first major film rights purchases came in 2004 with the purchase of the Muppets. While kids today may not think much of the Muppets, they were a major force under the direction of their creator and the voice of Kermit, Jim Henson in the late 70s, really through the early 90s, with television specials, a gig on Saturday Night Live, movies and even shows for the kids like the classic Muppet Babies that all 90s kids remember. However, However, after Henson died, they lost their creative voice and had lost a lot of their luster by the time Disney purchased them. Don't forget to send me a postcard from the Muppet Studios. Oh, yeah. The decision made sense and wasn't completely viewed as Henson's people cashing in, as Henson himself had met with Disney Imagineers in 1989 to imagine numerous concepts for a Muppet-themed park through the Disney brand. The plans were serious enough for Disney to announce their intentions publicly, which included numerous sketches for the planned parks. The most promising idea to come from that was the Great Muppet Movie Ride, which according to Henson himself was going to show what went on behind the scenes of a movie through the lens of the Muppets themselves, which was going to be as funny as it was incorrect. You better believe it, Buster! Enchanted Snow Palace. Grayson, <laughs> it's amazing. Thank you. I never knew what I was capable of. A lot of the most popular and beloved Disney animated films were based on stories written by Hans Christian Andersen, as Disney outbid the competition to buy the rights to his stories. And one of those stories was The Snow Queen, which was the basis for 2013's mega-hit Frozen. However, the story was in front of a lot of the people at Disney for years, including Mark Davis, the man responsible for designing Tinkerbell, Cruella de Vil, Maleficent, and parts of Disneyland like It's a Small World, World, the Haunted Mansion, and the Pirates of the Caribbean. In the late 70s, Davis was working on his next big addition to Disneyland, which was based on the story of the Snow Queen, the Enchanted Snow Palace. Considering the fact that Disneyland is and was located in California, Davis thought the people would appreciate a ride that took them into an air-conditioned palace by boat. They would have seen the Queen and all of the things she created with her ice powers, like polar bears and snow giants, like the one in Frozen, while also showing the interior of her castle with things like her ice throne. Sadly, there was no Olaf. It was not to be, as the late 70s brought more thrilling attractions and the Brain Trust at Disney decided to add more actual rides than simple attractions and the idea melted away. At least until around the time the movie Frozen was being made, they decided to use Davis's depiction of the Snow Queen when creating Elsa. You are the one who brought us together. Disney Sea. Yeah! Part of the proposed Port Disney complex was Disney Sea. Disney Sea was meant to ensure that people could experience the marvels of nature's secret world beneath the sea and to gain first hand experience of how the oceans affect human life as well as the life of the planet. The centerpiece of the park would have been Oceana, which was described as the focal point for the park that would have risen from the center of the park in a series of futuristic bubbles. This would have lured guests to a fascinating evolutionary journey through the world's seas. It would have included a state-of-the-art two-story aquarium which would have been as educational as it was entertaining. But the project went down when Port Disney lost out to Westcott, although aspects of it ended up in Japan. Let's hope the futuristic bubbles were part of it. Now's your moment, floating in a blue lagoon. The SS Disney. You will soon pay for what you did to me. I will be waiting. For you. Why would you be waiting for me?
Disney is in on the cruise business and has been for years. You can take your entire family on a Disney cruise and score some Dramamine off of a guy in a Mickey suit as you tour the Caribbean. However, those cruises really only replicate one aspect of going to Disneyland or Disney World, and it's really the worst part, and that's the aspect of meeting the characters from the movies. Beyond that, the closest thing to a ride would be if you fell off the side of the cruise ship and pretended it was Splash Mountain. Disney actually was planning on building a theme park on a ship so that it could bring it from port to port for people who'd never gone to a Disney theme park. While it would house only miniaturized versions of some of the more famous attractions like Tomorrowland and Adventureland, it would have been an amazing experience and also an amazing impetus for people to go to the real Disney theme parks. What are you going to do next? I'm going to Disney World! <laughs> However, the idea was pretty unrealistic as it would only visit each location once every five years and also would have been an engineering nightmare as it would have weighed an amazing amount, making the ship incredibly top-heavy, which is basically the last thing you'd ever want in a ship that is circumnavigating the globe, although it still sounds like an amazing idea. <laughs> the Dark Kingdom now you will never again see the light of death. If you live near a theme park, you'll be used to the autumn tradition in which the park gears up for Halloween and becomes an evil version of itself. For example, Valley Fair in Minnesota becomes Valley Scare. Now imagine that going on year-round. You're the birthday boy or girl! While Disney parks are building more and more attractions based on their recent acquisitions, like the Marvel Comics and Star Wars, the heart of the park is still based on the cartoons that turned the company into the juggernaut that it is still today. You can see the characters like the Little Mermaid or Belle from Beauty and the Beast walking around and taking pictures with people. But one thing you don't see are the villains from those cartoons, unless it's Halloween. Well, Disney planned to change all that by building the Dark Kingdom as part of Disney World in Florida. It would have been basically the Valley Scare version of Disney World, with a castle at the centerpiece, like at Disney World, only this castle would have been Maleficent's castle as opposed to the castle from Cinderella. This park would have cost hundreds of millions of dollars, and while both Disney World and Disneyland have been consistently growing and building since their inception, neither the land surrounding the parks nor the money behind them are unlimited. It's thought that the Dark Kingdom wasn't built because Disney had acquired both Marvel and Star Wars around that time for around $9 billion combined, so there simply wasn't enough money to go around. Oh, okay, back it up, back it up. Tomorrowland 2055 yeah! Many of the things that seem impossible now will become realities tomorrow. Disney's original Tomorrowland was created in a time where the space race between the United States and the USSR was just beginning, and because of that, Tomorrowland was heavily focused on space, and strangely, a lot of Monsanto-sponsored chemistry labs. So as time went on and Disneyland grew, Tomorrowland became outdated and was in desperate need of an overhaul. Enter Tomorrowland 2055. The original plan was for Star Wars creator George Lucas to design an entirely new Tomorrowland that would have upped the sci-fi vision that the original touched upon. Lucas's vision was amazing but would have taken a few years to complete and would have cost a fortune, so they decided to basically just update some of the attractions in Tomorrowland as opposed to completely tearing it down. They did implement one idea from Lucas's vision, Alien Encounter, which was eventually torn down itself because it terrified children, much like the Star Wars pre trilogy, but for different reasons. A beautiful tomorrow just to dream away. That says we're going places. Disney's America. A lot of people don't know that Disney attempted to build a third park in the United States that would have rivaled Disneyland and Disney World in terms of size and ambition, and also would have been a completely different sort of park. It was to be called Disney's America and would have been located in Manassas, Virginia. The idea behind it was that every year millions of people from around the world were traveling to Washington, D.C. So in 1992, Disney's thought that they'd open a theme park based on the history of America that people could visit while on their way there. Like Disneyland, the park would have been divided into different sections, with each section representing a different era in the history of the United States. 
The entrance, for example, would have been a Civil War era town where people could board an antique train that would bring them to a Native American village or to Ellis Island where European immigrants were becoming US citizens. Many people took issue with the plan for a myriad of reasons. Some thought that Disney was exploiting tragic events in American history. There's a reference to this in The Simpsons when Bart and his classmates attempt to visit a Civil War reenactment that used to be free but now costs money because of Disney, with the slogan saying, Sorry, there's money to be had. On top of that, the park would have been on top of an actual Civil War battle site, so the local government blocked it, and like the Confederacy, Disney's America was lost to history. This nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom. The Soviet Union at Epcot. Well, here's the thing, sweet potato. You ain't leaving Sunnyside. If you've spent any time on the internet, you've certainly heard the conspiracy theories that say Hollywood studios are both part of the Illuminati and also basically communists. So, after the fall of the Soviet Union back in 1991, and decades of a Cold War that literally was so tense that children in America were taught where to hide during a nuclear holocaust, somehow someone thought it would be a good idea to include a recreation of the Soviet Union within the Epcot Center. That one person actually happened to be the CEO of Disney at the time, Michael Eisner, which is where those conspiracy theories come in. Now it actually does make sense, as the Cold War was finally over. America had won, and it was really the first time that people in the US were able to look at Russia as anything but the scary place where onion or stone soup was the only thing one could eat. Since that veil of fear had been lifted, it's easy to see why it might make sense to highlight that in a park, as people were interested in seeing what life was really like in Moscow, after decades of propaganda showed bread lines and snow. I'll have your hands for a trophy, street rat! All this for a loaf of bread? The sketches of the park included a replica of the St. Basil's Cathedral, one of the most famous buildings in Russia, at least to us. And the rides would have been based on Russian myths and fairy tales. However, Disney liked to include sponsors with their parks to offset the operating costs, and obviously no American company wanted to be associated with Russia, Cold War or no Cold War, so the idea went the way of the USSR. National Harbor <coughs> Despite the rejection of Disney's America, Disney had done enough research into the DC metro area and clearly liked what they saw in regards to the amount of people that were traveling in and out of DC, either as tourists or as delegations from other countries. Because of that, Disney ended up purchasing 15 acres of land in Prince George County, Maryland, which was on the Potomac River in a town called Oxen Hill. Disney planned to build a 500-room resort on the site that was once a plantation. We'll have a Dalmatian plantation. A Dalmatian plantation, I say. Knowing that basically every single plot of land in that area is somehow involved in either the creation of the United States or the war to keep the United States united, Disney didn't immediately develop the land. Also, the site was in the same county as the Washington Redskins Stadium. It was a decent drive away from most attractions and isn't connected to the main public transportation options. Because of that and the fact that Disney had built another waterfront resort at the same time, this one in Hawaii as part of their Lilo and Stitch promotion, Disney ended up selling the land to a nearby developer, despite the extreme disappointment of everyone there. <coughs> Roger Rabbit's Hollywood As the recent $2 billion bailout of Euro Disney shows, it costs a lot of money to run a theme park. Part of offsetting that cost is sponsorships, which are readily apparent in parts of Disney World and Disneyland. It's not a liquid! Those sponsorships also helped Disney begin to acquire its massive library of characters and the merchandise that comes with them. The best combination of those sponsorships and acquisitions was Disney MGM Studios, which opened at Disney World and displayed characters like Roger Rabbit, who Disney had recently acquired. Because of the massive popularity of the film Who Framed Roger Rabbit, Disney actually planned an entire park within Disney World around Roger. It would have been called Roger Rabbit's Hollywood and would have included attractions 
locations based on people and places in the film. For example, it would have had Maroon Studios, which is the cartoon studio in the film, the Acme Warehouse, and much more. While that sounds more than amazing and a surefire hit, even now, Steven Spielberg got involved. His company, Amblin, believed that it also had the rights to Roger Rabbit, and the idea fell apart. Although some rides were created and placed around the parks. Well, don't be goofy. Go ahead and hit that subscribe button and ring that notification bell for your chance to win an iPhone X.